Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and news in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And we're going to be looking at some new headlines, talk about some new CDs that have come out, uh, some summer movies we've already seen, and we want to start the first in a series of looking at scores to summer movies. So uh, let's just jump right in. Kevin, you found a couple of headlines uh, come uh, that were out in the news this week. What did you yeah, find? There, there are a couple of things that have popped up the past couple of weeks. It was announced maybe two or three weeks ago, I think. Um, uh, Avengers composer Alan Silvestri has been hired to score Red 2, which is the uh, Bruce Willis movie that was a sequel to the other Bruce Willis movie. Retired um, and... Re- retired Extremely Dangerous, yeah. Okay. Which I really liked. It was a good movie. It was fun. It was fun. Uh, it was cute, yeah. The, the uh, Christoph Beck did the first score... And it was, I, I don't think there was a ton to it. So this, I, to me, seems like definitely an upgrade in the composer department. Um, so they that would be want more action. Maybe. I mean, this, you know, when, when I think when we think of Silvestri scores, you think action movies, but action movies kind of tied to some sort of license or, or character or something, whether it's yeah. you know, the future or Predator or Avengers or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, the red was just sort of a straightforward shoot 'em up Bruce Willis action movie. Uh, that was, that was funny. Uh, mm-hmm. so it, it'll be kind of interesting to hear a, a Sylvester score in that kind of context. So, cool. um, in addition to that, there's an article that popped up on Variety's website, uh, about the evolution of superhero music. And they, they talk a little bit about Man of Steel and some of the things that Hans Zimmer is doing in that article or in that score. Uh, and also some of the things that Brian Tyler did for Iron Man 3. So you can check that out. We have uh, a, a link to that on our website, um, soundnotion.tv slash SAP. You can find the article from there. Cool. Uh, some things I found, uh, and I want to make a quick mention, when we talk about our summer scores, because uh, Iron Man 3 is already out at this point with the Brian Tyler score, we'll be referring to some parts in the article, um, the John Burlingham article, because he does make some points and we want to talk about in, uh, in relation to what we've already seen. And, of course, the Superman or Man of Steel score is uh, – parts of it are available, which I'm going to mention in just a second. But that movie and that score have yet to fully be released um, sure. within the next month or so. So we'll, we'll be referring to the article a little bit as we talk about the summer movies. Anyway, um, so for uh, people wondering, four people wondering after the third trailer to there, this. There are at least four people wondering. Yeah, right. <laughs> Four or maybe right. five. Yeah, I mean, there's not, a handful. Not, uh, you know, it's like point oh 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 one percentage of the population. Uh, after the last Man of Steel trailer came out, there was some con- not concern, but uh, curiosity about is that Hans Zimmer's music? Is that what it's going to sound like? Because the first two trailers used uh, a combination of Howard Shore and uh, Craig Armstrong and and Hans Zimmer music from an earlier film, and uh, this one actually was Hans Zimmer's music, and now that um, samples are available on Amazon and the, the WB Water Tower website where you can listen to uh, a preview of each track, you can definitely hear that, yes, it's from the film, but uh, there was a blog, and we've got the, the link to it um, at soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can actually see Hans Zimmer uh, writing in and saying, yeah, that was one of our cues we did. Of course, I don't know what's keeping someone from just logging in, creating an account, and calling themselves Hans Zimmer. But anyway, uh, it was uh, like a music technology blog, and and he chimed in and, and added his two cents to it. But um, also, we do have the link. There's a, a, a easy enough 17-minute uh, preview that you can find on YouTube, and we've got the link to that where the um, ex- expanded it's clips release. kind of stitched together, right? Yeah, yeah. There's going to be like a couple releases, and one is this expanded release with about 17 tracks, and there's a minute of each. So it's about 17 long um, video or so, or, or just audio preview, and you can hear little bits of music that was featured in the trailers. So, um, so pretty cool, uh, especially if you're following that or if you're as interested as I know I am. So uh, anyway, and Kevin, you found out something that was interesting. Yeah, this is, this is I think, a pretty big piece of news that has been floating around for the past week and a half or so. Um, you know, we, we mentioned uh, a few months ago on our show, John Williams was conducting a concert of his music. And before he played the or conducted the, the opening fanfare from Star Wars, 
he had mentioned the idea of, of coming back and scoring the new movie in, in 2015 and all that kind of stuff. And everybody got all wound up that he, he had was basically saying that he wanted to do it. And then a few weeks ago, Michael Giacchino said that he hoped John Williams would score the, the new Star Wars movies, even though we think of Michael Giacchino as the J.J. Abrams composer. Yeah. Um, so both of those things kind of fueled the fire a little bit. But this, this past week or two, um, really the strongest statement has come out, which was J.J. Abrams himself saying that he, he thinks that John Williams will score Episode 7. Um, and it, he, I think, is, is pretty much the one to make that decision. Um, because, of course, Kathleen Kennedy is the executive producer, and she works with Williams and all the Spielberg movies. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, she's obviously not going to have an issue. So if if A.J. If J. J. Abrams is saying that Williams is going to score the film and Williams has expressed interest in it, you kind of have to imagine that hopefully that's what's going to happen. So. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we'll, we'll follow the um, developments of that, but I'm sure it'll probably – end up coming down to uh, a J.J. Abrams film with music by John Williams. So we'll, we'll see. Right. Um, I just want to mention a couple things that we've seen. Like I said, we're going to go into more depth, but I um, lately, uh, as far as movies I've been able to take in since the last show, uh, I have seen uh, Oblivion. I've seen the Iron Man 3. Um, there's a new show on Netflix called Hemlock Grove. Um, I've seen the, uh, the Evil Dead remake or... Or is it? Bill, what do you think of the Hemlock Grove? Well, Dave, I'll tell you what I think of it. Um, Actually, so we're going to save the film ones to talk about in just a moment. Oh, sorry. I I didn't know you were going to talk about that later. But I... No, no, no. Okay. No, that's fine. Because the the film ones we'll save if they're like Iron Man 3. But the TV ones I wanted to to mention just very quickly. And then I'll let Kevin talk about what he's seen. Um, The Hemlock Grove is, uh, from all the advertising, you can tell there's definitely like like a werewolf element. Uh, and and there is, but there's uh, there's a lot of things intentionally hidden throughout the show. But um, but anyway, onto the music. Uh, there's a guy named Nathan Barr and B A R R who's composed uh, the music for it, and he's kind of a staple. In I've seen him, I've seen his name plenty of times for for other television shows, and I want to say feature film work. But I, again, you know how well we do research on this podcast. We're so up to the minute to bring you the news that we just don't have time to work on all the details so because we care that much about our listeners it anyway makes little or no sense <laughs> <laughs> so uh i it, it appears or it sounds as though the producers of hemlock grove wanted to get a kind of creepy sound kind of the way dexter sounds and that uh that main title is i believe rolf kent i think it, so for people that aren't familiar with hemlock grove uh, Hemlock Grove is a new show on Netflix that is about 13 episodes long, and it's sort of following the same. Um, it's following the same format as uh, House of Cards, where it's been dropped all at once, and you can just simply watch the entire season. And um, it's this it, horror Eli Roth thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of a horror mystery. There's a whodunit element to it as well. There's uh, they downplay. The supernatural element, but eventually it 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 rears its head, and and so it that becomes a part of the show as well. But it's kind of the way Game of Thrones is medieval and has a fantasy element, but they very sparingly emphasize the fantasy until certain key moments, and they're kind of following suit with that. I um I had some issues with the show by the end, but this isn't really a TV critique show where we talk about the narrative and the pacing and the writing and the editing. Um, or the acting, so I won't go into all those things. But uh, I think the music was fine, and it does uh, it does set forth a very, you know, appropriate c- kind of creepy, mysterious kind of tone, um, and uh, it's got a nice main title montage. So it's kind of like uh, like Netflix is is handling it very similarly to how they handled House of Cards, so that they have a uh, composer who gets a main title and gets good representation for about a, a minute and a half. And it's there on every episode. They never cheat the opening credits. So the composer always gets his theme heard. So it's, it's nice. It's like, like House of Cards was for, um, uh, for uh, ooh, Jeff Beal. Was that who did House yeah, of Cards? Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, 
and, and, and kind of nice. And it's well produced, so they they have some pretty well known actors in it, and and uh, and you know the look and the visual effects are all pretty appropriately consistent. So anyway, um, that was good. Um, I don't not sure if we're going to consider Evil Dead a full on summer movie, but um, it had a very decent score by Roque Banos with the he's got the tilde on the end. Uh, Roque has been. Uh, he's been writing film music for quite a while, but just not so much in the States and, and with Hollywood films. So um, so the Spanish composer did, uh, I think, a really good job uh, using full orchestra. He wasn't resorting to uh, like overuse of synths or anything like that. Uh, um, at, that was, so the, the sound of it was, was very cool, um, but, uh, but also just you know, matching the tone and... and Everything was was uh, very serviceable. I can't hum it. It's not um, it's not memorable. Is uh, it's not memorable in any sense of of uh, like you walk away with the tune or anything like that. But anyway, so yep, Kevin, what have you been listening to this? Um, well, you had mentioned Oblivion and uh, Iron Man three. Another score I'd been checking out a little bit uh, was Mark Isham's score to Forty Two, which was the Jackie Robinson movie uh, with Harrison Ford. Um, and it's it's nice. It's sort of your kind of typical nostalgic lyrical uh, orchestral kind of score. You know, I think one of the big criticisms of that film was that it tended to be a little um, a little sentimental and yeah. get kind of over the top and sort of you know pushing the audience buttons along the way. Uh, and, and I think the score it's nice, but it kind of mirrors that a little bit. It reminds me a little bit of the Randy Newman score to The Natural. It's just all kind of big, expansive, baseball stadium, slow motion sounding kind of stuff. Um, it's it's nice. It's, you know, it's worth checking out, I suppose. Um, but it did kind of didn't blow me away very much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the Oblivion and the Iron Man 3 in just a second. But first, there's been some uh, new CD releases, and I just wanted to give a shout out to... Uh, some re- releases by Entrada, and um, of course, Screen Archives is like one of my favorite sites. So I give a unsolicited shout out to them because they have all these for for purchase, and they don't pay us for that. And they, they right? Then they don't. Pay they us. should. They are welcome to, but they don't. That's right. <laughs> this is totally just uh, out of goodwill. But no. Um, so there was a, a movie speech list that had Gina Davis and Michael Keaton in it, with a score by Mark Shaman, and it's now released. The, uh, the Western Bandolero by Jerry Goldsmith is out. Willard, with a score by the late Shirley Walker, is now available. Firebirds, the, the, the helicopter movie with Tommy Lee Jones from, I don't even know if it made it into the 90s. That may have been like late 80s. No, maybe 90s. I can't remember. David Newman wrote the score for that. That's out. Uh, classic Henry Mancini, a days, The Days of Wine and Roses is out. Um, Five Days from Home, I mentioned because Bill Conti composed it, uh, very well known for The Right Stuff and, of course, Rocky. Um, And then kind of a double feature, for again, for Jerry Goldsmith fans. I mentioned one earlier, but this is uh, Von Ryan's Express and The Detective put together on one album. Both of those scores are quite quite a bit before, I'd say, he hit it really big by the, the mid to late 70s and 80s. They come before that. So any diehard Goldsmith fans... Uh, there's three there. Two of them are on one album. Another one is on its own album. So very, very cool. Uh, all right. So let's talk about summer movies. Um, so Kevin and I recently saw Iron Man 3. Or, you know, let's talk about Oblivion first since that we did see that. Is that okay, Kevin? That's fine. All right. We'll go in chronological order. Uh, Oblivion, science fiction movie with Tom Cruise, uh, directed by Joseph Kaczynski, most recently known for directing and writing Tron Legacy. I also wrote and directed Oblivion, and it's very evident that there's a lot of science fiction references throughout. Um, it's not just a science fiction story. I mean, there's lots of visual cues and lots of story beats or plot developments, without trying to spoil it, that are connected to a lot of previously written, created, and made science fiction movies. There's probably a better way to say all that, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, I... Very quickly, I found the score to to work pretty well. It seems to be an, a consistent thing where Kaczynski has a sound in mind, and it seems to favor like synthesizers and electronics. So, of course, there was Daft Punk and their score that he used with Tron Legacy, mm-hmm. and with this one, he used uh, M eighty three, and uh, well, 
M83 as the group and then Joseph Trapanese as the individual composer. Um, like, did I leave one out? Is that? Did you mention Anthony Gonzalez? Anthony Gonzalez is, is, um, a collaborator as well. And, and it seems as though, uh, Kaczynski is kind of being consistent from film to film so far. I mean, two science fiction films back to back, and he seems to have a somewhat consistent, uh, approach musically, although he's getting it from different composers, different collaborators. Yeah. But the, uh, yeah, the treatment of the score within the film is very similar. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Kevin and I had discussed it. Um, I won't speak for him, but I'll just say that an observation that I noticed was, um, if you kind of go in with a checklist, like, well, you know, I, I need a big melody. I need like a lot of change in texture. Your checklist approach is not going to serve you very well. Cause I think this, the cues, often were have a, a mostly kind of full texture and seemed to do a lot of swells, just kind of like rise up and kind of ebb yeah. and flow. And so they provide tension in that the sound is bigger, but then they kind of subside and it seems to work in like waves of sound. And the, the waves are generated through um, different harmonies and it's very consistent. So lots of minor chords kind of, um, adjacent and, and whatnot, uh, like it was in Tron Legacy. Um, but this time, I'm not even sure. I, it sounded mostly, if it, if not all synthesized, I would say like 80 to 90% mm -hmm. synthesized. Where I don't even know if they bothered to record anybody. But anyway. you know, I, th I think there there was some uh, acoustic stuff on it. I remember some some, especially some percussion things that didn't seem synthesized. Um, you know, I. I feel like anytime we run into a score like this, that that we just kind of pick on it, and it's maybe that's not fair. You know, it's to some extent it's it's silly for us to hope that you know it's it's not 1983 anymore. People aren't writing John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith type scores, and so I, it's not that that's necessarily a requirement. That you know, like you said, you having kind of a checklist of what you want from a score. I mean, to some extent, you have to let the score be what it wants to be. My my issue with it, if you want to have a score that's largely synthesized and, and textural and, and things like that, because that's what a lot of people are doing today, fine. I, I can't really harp on you for not wanting to have a big Jerry Goldsmith score in your film, because that's not how most people are doing it. My my issue, and and I think that issue is is maybe sort of on display with this score to Oblivion is that if if all you're doing like you kind of described it's it's, it's kind of pads and swells and textures and and there's not a whole lot more going on if that's if that if that's all that you're asking the score to do it there's not much that that can contribute I think uh, dramatically and and for me the the big the big thing was at the the climactic point of this this film, where, you know, without giving any way huge spoilers, it's you know it's it's the the key, the kind of hero has his his moment in the sun, so to speak. Um, it you know the the emotionally it's the biggest moment of the whole film. But but because of the nature of what these scores are, I just remember thinking as I'm watching that scene. The only musical option that there was to to elevate the film to this moment, the only option that the composers had and what they ended up doing was having the drum set play louder. That was I mean, that was kind of it. It's that okay, here's the big moment. Just just wail away on this on the, the, the drum set. That's that's kind of the only tool in our toolbox that we have now. That to me that's that's the issue with those kinds of scores. It's, it's not that I have a problem with someone who wants to do a synthesized score or a score that's mostly textures. If that's what you want, that's fine. But I haven't, I haven't run into too many scores yet where that's the type of score that a composer was writing, but they were also able to bring a, a sophisticated sense of drama to that music. It's most of these scores... They can't do much other than be there. And that's kind of what I felt this score did was when it really needed to play out and to shine, they didn't have many options to let it do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, um, 
it's like you said. I mean, the the approach is completely different. Sorry, I totally had a thought and I just lost it a second ago. Um, with uh, yeah, no, no, I lost it. Yeah, I can't get it back. All right. So any other <laughs> good, good talk, Bill. Good talk. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts about um the Oblivion or no? Okay, I got it. I know what it was. Um, you know, just li- reading to some of the reviews and looking at Rotten Tomatoes and listening some to some critique podcasts about the uh, the film Oblivion, just the film itself. Uh, you know, one one word that comes up is like it's kind of cold or it's kind of detached. It's science fiction, and those don't have to go hand in hand, but they, sometimes they often do. If you can recall, two thousand one, they're they're det- they're literally detached, and they're in kind of a sterile cold, symbolically cold or emotionally cold environment, you know, in the space station. Uh, Other movies that I don't want to go into more because they are obviously more connected to the the film um, Oblivion and and would let on about the plot. But they they also have other sterile, cold, detached kind of elements at play in those films as well. And I think that kind of film score with the electronics and with it's just really almost like a rhythmic drive throughout Mm-hmm. It seems to just contribute to that. Like that music doesn't do anything more than what it does. And so if the director is like, I do want it to be a little detached or a little bit sort of very matter of fact, it's it's there behind the scenes kind of pushing it through, then it's going to do that. And so it does follow the kind of modern or more contemporary approach of it does not comment on the, the tone or the emotion of the scene. It yeah. Simply that, that's supports a good way it. of describing it. Yeah. What's that? It yeah. I said that's a good way of describing it. That it's not music that comments on what's going on. It's it's just kind of there. And I think, I think that's part of the trend of these scores. Is I think that's something that the directors and producers like. And, yeah. and I know Chris, Christopher Nolan is a big proponent of that. That he's, he, you know, to to him, I think like a John Williams type score where the music is constantly sort of chiming in and reflecting almost everything that's going on. To him, that's a very that, – that, that's a big turnoff. He doesn't want the music that is trying – You know, I, a lot of people look at that and say, okay, that's music trying to influence the audience or trying to steer the audience, which I mean I think there's a little bit of validity to the argument. Um, but, but yeah, the idea that the music is there but it's not there as a, a – a manipulation device towards the audience, which I think a lot of people look at older film scores and that's sort of how they see them, which I don't know if that's entirely fair, but I know that's how some people think about them. Well, it'll be really interesting when Man of Steel comes out because a lot of people who really like film music uh, know or are pretty familiar with the John Williams score from about 30 years ago. And it hits all the beats. I mean, it's got all the themes for all the characters. It's got great action music. It's got great romantic music. Uh, it's great. It's got great sort of superhero exciting music as well. And uh, and it's just I keep arriving at the conclusion that you know times have just changed since thirty years ago, sure. and you sure. you you find newer ways to express those things. So, as evidenced by the most recent trailer, even the first time I was watching it, I just thought, you know, if Hans Zimmer can make it. Uh, exciting, then I'm on board with it. And and I realized, you know, after g- getting through all three Batman movies with him and Nolan, that it, he's not going to do those things. And he's said basically as much. Like, it's really hard to try to equal the work that's been done before by somebody like Williams, especially when it's a really iconic theme like Superman. So you have to go in a whole other approach or a whole other direction. But but anyway, just real quick to close out on Oblivion. So yeah, I think I think to be a little detached or a little sterile or a little mechanical uh was part of the approach i think that was intentional and it did that so yeah. so you know for that it, it was given cool. the nature of the story it's, it's a very the the um what's what i'm looking for um the predicament they're in is a very lonely kind of thing and and yeah, so right. and and, and it, again it make it would make it makes sense to have a score that reflects that but you know like like you said I I like a score that comments a little bit more on what's going on as opposed to just kind of laying back and let the action happen. And and this was not a score that did that very much. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. Well, the next thing I want to look at is the Brian Tyler score to Iron Man 3. So Kevin and I actually saw uh, – I think we saw both of these films together. Right? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah. So Iron Man 3, uh, the very first one was Re- Raman Jawadi. This Iron Man 2, the second one, was uh, John Debney. Mm-hmm. And so now you get to the third one, and it has Brian Tyler. And now, of course, after having that long discussion we just had about how sometimes these scores are just what they are. They're, they're not going to go out of their way to satisfy you. So you sometimes right. just need to say it is what it is, and, and that's it. Don't come in with a checklist of expectations. Although with a superhero movie, sometimes there are a couple th- things on my wish list, like a, some, something like a signal or, a, or a, a musical signature. It doesn't have to be a long theme, but something that seems to be pretty memorable would, would be what, what I would hope for. Yeah. And I will say, just from the trailers to Man of Steel, there seem to be, of course, uh, in all fairness, or as a disclaimer, I've listened to them quite a bit, but there do seem to be certain things that have emerged. With the Iron Man 3, I did hear a tune, but the tune annoyed me. <laughs> Sorry. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Brian Tyler. I mean, it sort of was like, uh, I, it, it, it felt pretty generic. But in his defense, it was, you know, large orchestra and um, really sort of... Uh, high octane, you know, really high adrenaline, very loud, lots of brass. Um, I don't know if it had a lot of like popular elements like electric guitar and sort of a rock band sound like some of the previous Iron Man films did for, for obvious reasons. I I think, I I think one of the, maybe the big issues with the Iron Man scores for the first two movie, two movies is, um, you know, you you think of of Black Sabbath song Iron Man, and that that's kind of what they they introduced that early on. I think in the first Iron Iron Man movie, and it seems like they never let the scores get too far away from that that sort of Black Sabbath rock kind of sound. Uh huh. This this score seemed to depart from that um the, the most. The score for the first movie always kept very close to that, it almost. As if some scenes in the film were maybe scored by Black Sabbath or something like that. Um, the, the the Brian Tyler score for the third movie, I think, is the most departed from that, um, but still not entirely. Um, the article that I mentioned, uh, John Burlingham wrote for Variety, where he talks about superhero scores and how they've changed over the eras or the the last few decades. Uh, he does talk a little bit about the Hans Zimmer approach, but that's you know, we've only heard a little bit that remains to be seen all the way because the movie hasn't come out. But the Iron Man 3 has come out already. And he does talk a little bit about Brian's approach that they did want to have a more Star Wars approach or something where there's a classic theme. And he goes on to describe that there's themes for the Mandarin, who's the, as you know, by the advertising, the main villain. And there's another sort of side character in the film and they get a theme as well. And, you know, I don't I don't recall any of these after having seen the film. It's, you know, it was interesting to read that article or, or just to kind of skim through it after having seen the film because you're right. They, he talks a lot about doing kind of a classic Star Wars Superman kind of approach to the score. They recorded in Abbey Roads just like uh, Star Wars. The, the article says that even Brian Tyler tracked down some of the same microphones that John Williams used on Star Wars. So it sounded like he was going for this kind of classic big orchestral heroic score type of thing. And it was, it was interesting to read that after having seen the film, because that was kind of not the sense that I was left with at all, having seen the film and heard the score. Well, it just, it re- makes me, and I don't mean to be all negative about this kind of thing, but these movies are made to have an instant impact and the music is loud. So it serves that purpose and it's exciting when it needs to be exciting. But, but I, I I'm left uh, having a pretty empty experience and, one of the reasons that that wasn't the case with Star Wars is that it was evident in the the record sales. You know, was just incredibly sure. high, and 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 also it did it did uh, it did do something different than other scores were doing at the time. And so now there's so many more movies that come out all the time, and so it, it is it is very challenging. So the composers at work now have a lot. They're they're working against the grain in a lot of ways, or or just yeah. trying to to work upstream. But I wanted to uh, let's see also mention that. Um, or no, no, I had another thought and I, I lost it, but, but basically, um, with, with the Iron Man three, it, it was serviceable and I, I'll give it that, that it, you know, it, it yeah. was all that it needed to be at the right moments and, and everything was there, but I wasn't left 
with any kind of, uh, I wasn't humming anything or, or, and, oh, okay. So here's my thought. I, I regained it. That's the moral of today's episode, I guess, is Bill forgets, then Bill remembers. So uh, I quoted or I played a clip from uh, a podcast uh, columnist, writer, Drew McWeeny, uh, several episodes back, where he talked about with the Avengers, um, one of the the sort of tragedies musically was that they had not created a good central theme for all the other characters. Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America was maybe an exception. Thor, maybe a slight exception. But then, then they had the opportunity to put, weave them together in the score for the Avengers. And it was really just kind of a little too late because Silvestri was able to weave his Captain America music a little bit into the score. But I kept thinking of that while I saw Iron Man 3. Like, here would have been a third movie and a chance for you to just sort of keep reemphasizing like a great theme if you had had one from the start. And it, it does feel a little like, you know, too late. Like, it's the third yeah. movie. So nothing's going to stick musically at this point unless you just bring back out the electric guitars and hint at yeah. the I mean, seven. And that's that's sort of been, you know, this is now the third movie, like you said. And it, I, Captain America had a pretty good score. Avengers had a pretty good score. Um, the Patrick Doyle score to Thor wasn't too bad. But it seems like Iron Man is just kind of can't, can't catch a break in the music department, you know? Well, I mean, at least the movies are successful because that's yeah. what... Marvel needs them to be, and I think they're probably trapped between he's uh, he's a cool guy, but he's kind of like of the moment. He's sort of nice, but he's got like a he's a little sarcastic and cynical. So he's very he, he's very much like like the way our culture is the yeah. the Robert Downey Jr. character of Tony Stark, and so especially the way he's portrayed, and it's very entertaining and very funny. Um, but I think that gives some challenge to the how what's our musical approach because if it's really sincere and has like a long theme like Superman or even Danny Elfman's Spider-Man, the cynicism that's in those movies doesn't mesh with a long theme. When you can see yeah. something coming and predict how it's going to end, then you're cynical. And when you can predict something, then that immediately means like, oh, well, now it's bad because I know how it's going to turn out. So it does seem to be inherently difficult in, within the DNA of that character to yeah. create a musical approach unless you just go out for, let's just have some cool sounds with a beat and it'll kick butt, and that's what we want because that's what the character does. Then, in a way, that's maybe one of the better solutions. Um, I mean, that was largely the approach for the first couple of movies too. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, as soon as John Debney got the second movie and he realized that the the one of the villains was Russian, then he had what what you could say is predictable, but still is somewhat appropriate. He had a very sort of Russian sound he created for that character because it seemed to work with him. Uh, so big male chorus and and sort of the Russian sort of percussion or sort of very driving yeah. marsh-like. Which kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and while you can say, well, uh, that's so obvious or that's so, like that's the first idea you'd have. Let's maybe come up with a better one or, or refine it. It, on one level, it works, and it does establish location and uh, somewhat of a cultural identity. But mm -hmm. it, it, again, it it's tricky for that character. If it's Peter Parker, it might be easier because he's a teenager who's um, is picked on. And if it's Clark Kent, he's a uh, you know a, a guy who has like the biggest secret in the world, and he can't share it with anybody. Mm -hmm. So there's 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 elements there. But anyway, it is um, it's it's been interesting just to note these different approaches. So. I, I, overall, Iron Man three was entertaining. It was cool, and I think the score like aided in that and helped it to be that. Um, I just, you know, in in one go, it's hard to leave uh, and remembering any of the elements that that go into the score. Yeah. Um, so, and sometimes it's a, like a different situation than it was thirty years ago. So it wasn't uh, a, a song based score over here and a really really electronic synthesizer dissonant score over here. And then here's a guy who comes out with themes that sound like they're Holst mixed with Wagner. I mean, that stood out when it yeah. came out. And now and, and it's, you know, every those, other thing could do, do that. Yeah, those, I mean, those, the examples you give, those are very, obviously very different types of scoring. And, and I wonder if, if that's part of the issue with some of these new, specifically the new superhero scores. It's something you hear a lot with regard to the movies themselves, that, these movies are so big and so expensive 
that they have to be maybe generics not quite a fair word but they have to be um approachable enough to as wide an, an audience as possible because when you're spending several hundred million bucks to to yeah. make promote a movie you you literally have to go after everybody in terms of audience you do I you, wonder yeah. if that's maybe what's happening with the scores too is it's, it might be just along with the movies they're trying it's trying to be so encompassing and trying to be so many things at once that it ends up not being anything yeah because it's trying to be everything and that is happening to all the movies everywhere in all styles. They're trying to appeal to everybody. So yeah. you, and, you're and never going see, to do that. I wonder if we sort of see that parallel in, in the scores as well. I, I think so. I think it's filtering in a little bit. They, it's safer for them to just aid the movie, make it work in, a, in the most basic way, and then not have to do anything further than that. And then yeah. let the movie come out and let it make financially what it's going to make. Um, I wish... You, they didn't do it. I wish they took an extra five minutes and, and said, let's do more. And, you know, maybe it, from my end, that's what it seems to be. But maybe from their end, who knows? Maybe they feel like we did put our all into this. But mm-hmm. then, then you can go into the old man, you know, get off my lawn argument about the, comp- the younger composers are not as good or ch- as trained or as um, style, stylistly, stylistically – um, varied as they used to be or as capable. And sometimes I hear the music and it's like, nope, that's exactly a proper criticism. And other times yeah. it's like, well, no, it's like, just it's, leave them be. You're, you're right. You're right. There, there's a little bit of an old man, get off my lawn kind of thing. And I sort of feel like that's a drum that we've beat quite a lot on the show and maybe we should stop beating it quite so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, but anyway, uh, anything else you'd like to say? I think I got it all out of my system. Yeah. I, the only thing I would mention is this is kind of our part one of summer movie scores with Oblivion and Iron Man and Evil Dead. Uh, next time around, we're going to, I'm sure, take a close look at Star Trek. And I'm sure there will be more out regarding Man of Steel and some of the other big summer movies. So that's kind of what we're looking at on our next show, I think. Yeah, definitely. So we'll be looking forward to the Giacchino, Star Trek Into Darkness. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and that, of course, we'll, we'll still be uh, waiting for the uh, Man of Steel. But. To the new Thor movie as well, is that right? I don't remember exactly when that comes out, but that's coming um, out. I think it's November. Is this really far away? Okay. Yeah, Thor's not a summer movie, right. Okay. Um, uh, Wolverine might be, though, but I think yeah, that's July. Mm. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, anyway. That's All right, well, that will do it for – what's that, Kevin? I said that's what we're looking at next. Yes. Um, so that'll do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can uh, listen to us on the soundnotion.tv slash SAP. Uh, you can subscribe to the show, leave comments, and find links to the music that we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. So my name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. Thank you for joining us this week. And we'll leave you with a cool remix. So... Boys and girls, you can have your cake and eat it too, where it combines a little bit of the John Williams music from the 1978 Superman score with a little bit of the Hans Zimmer music from this year's Man of Steel. So enjoy about 30 seconds of the Last Sons remix.